active wildland fire here in the Black Forest area. I went outside and I could see the smoke. It's extremely hot out, it's windy, and that just fans the fire. They said when it started that it was moving south. And then they said um, it was moving west. And then they said it turned around and it was moving back that way. Get out. I, I don't care if you've heard official word yet or not. If you are in Black Forest in the vicinity of this fire, get out. If my family was up here in Black Forest, I am not waiting for official advice. I am getting my family out of there right now because the fire weather conditions are so explosive. It, it, what, you know what, the first thing that went through my mind, if we could have only gotten here 45 minutes beforehand. I told myself I wouldn't do this. <laughs> It's, it's still difficult because it was a loss, you know, and you still grieve. You know, the tears that you shed are the ones that you just couldn't get to. You just go, ah, it's, a, it's, it's a crying shame that we just couldn't have gotten here 40 minutes earlier or half an hour earlier. Our bedroom was where you see the slab and then uh, the front entryway was there. It was a small little place, but it was comfortable. And people say, well, it's been almost five years. <laughs> Girl, you have not a clue. <laughs> you know, I get to see it every day. I know people want answers, but I want to be right. And we cannot afford to guess. We better be right. Thanks for joining us as we take a look back on the Black Forest Fire. I'm Diane Derby. And I'm Don Ward. It's been five years now, but everywhere you look in this part of Black Forest, there's evidence of just what happened when the most destructive wildfire in Colorado history swept through this community. Hundreds of families lost their homes. And every one of them has a story about June 11th, 2013. 11 News anchor Rebecca Hager has one story. And this is why he likes being out here. <laughs> There's a reason families love living in Black Forest. It's just beautiful out here. People in Black Forest are kind of their own, you know, and it's special for everyone. You could see all the trees and all the mountains when you first wake up in the morning. When Jennifer Corbin Carson and her husband made Black Forest home in 2007, they never thought they'd be rebuilding six years later. You don't think it'll ever happen to you. Stacia just sadly reported that one structure is on fire in Black Forest. We're not sure if it's a home. But on June 11th, 2013, everything changed. We were in town and my friend called me and said, there's a fire in Black Forest and my heart just sank. So we planned as we were coming home. Their son, Patrick, was 11 months old at the time. As the flames spread, Jennifer, her husband, and then teenage daughter packed up two vehicles. They had an hour and a half. The houses on the other side of the circle were burning. The sheriff had come up and said, you need to leave now. I remember leaving, you know, going down the driveway and looking in the rear view mirror saying, you know, I wonder if I'll ever see this house again. After about two weeks, they were allowed to return to their home, or at least what was left of it. It was almost like you're going into a war zone, you know, because the, the Humvee was parked at, at Shoop and, and Black Forest Road, and, uh, you know, there's still smoke. When we come up the driveway, it was, it was very emotional. You know, the ashes, seeing your home in ashes, and, um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Um, you know, you, then you know, you know, you have to rebuild from scratch. 
you know, that's a home that you have with your family. So this is the china that I was telling you about. Other than what they could pack in their cars, these buckets and tubs in the basement are all that's left of a home full of memories. This was your mom's This was my mom's china, yep. Patrick, now five, still finds charred and broken pieces in the yard. I was digging, then I just found it underground when it was not burnt into ashes. The Carson's rebuilt in about a year. You can see we still have piles of the burned logs. Jennifer says the decision just felt like the next step. But with the fire in their past, they've decided to be closer to family. Her husband just started a new job in Georgia. Jennifer and Patrick will be joining him soon. You have the community helping you, you know, after the fire. But there's something to be said about being around family and having that support. But Colorado Springs will always feel like home, and the impact of the Black Forest Fire will travel with them. I appreciate things more. You know, I try to look up at the mountains every day and say thank you, you know, for letting me live here because I just enjoy this area so much. That family chose to rebuild, but many did not, like the family that lives here. They told us one object they found in the ashes helped them move forward. I first met that family after the fire when they made that remarkable discovery. I caught up with them again recently. Little baby Jesus was way down in the bottom here. For this to pop up out of all that ash and just looking like a little piece of charcoal, I, I, I might well have gotten impatient and missed it. When Ted and Teresa Robertson found part of their nativity scene in the rubble of their home, they knew it was a sign they'd be okay. I just dropped it in her hand and I didn't tell her I'd found it though. It was quite a moment. And for this to have survived that heat and still be intact. Um, it's pretty uh, powerful. Yeah, it is very powerful. That was five years ago. A lot has changed since then. They've made some additions to the gravesides of their beloved pets. So here's Malcolm. He was the cat that was living here at the time. And downed many of the burned trees. We estimate there were 12 to 1500 trees. But much of it is still the same. The only thing standing, their chimneys surrounded by ash, twisted metal and broken glass. Our bedroom was where you see the slab and then uh, the front entryway was there, and our kitchen was sort of back here in the middle. The Robertsons decided not to rebuild. Teresa was raised in the trees. She was, uh, since 1962, she was out here. She didn't think she could come back unless things were kind of the same, and that's going to be a long, long time. Ted vividly remembers the day everything changed. I was at my office, and a friend of mine was driving past uh, from Monument and saw the smoke plume and, and called me. And he said, you might want to head out in that direction, which I did. He and Teresa were home for two and a half hours grabbing what they could. Then an urgent warning to get out. The highway patrolman pulled up in the front yard and said, I want you guys to listen to something. Because we were inside the house. We could not see what was coming. We were watching the television and watching the news and seeing the coverage but had no idea that that fire was less than an eighth of a mile from here. And you could hear these poofs and pops and those were the trees exploding. He said, you guys really need to go. And probably within 15 minutes of that, the, the fire rolled over the neighborhood. They took off and stopped about a mile and a half away. We watched as that big, giant plume of smoke rolled over our neighborhood. And as it started to cross Herring Road, we knew. We, we knew our house was in the path. More than two decades of memories gone in just minutes. We were sort of the unlucky folks in the middle where a finger of fire kind of reached up and took everything. Everything but the baby Jesus they found sifting through the ashes. That was a defining moment for us. That was the moment that gave us the hope. The fire moved so far, so fast, there was nothing that could be done to save some of the homes like this one. But some houses did have a fighting chance, and we're about to take you inside one such fight with video from the Colorado Springs Fire Department. Fire crews scrambling to save what they can. This never before aired video shows a barn that was already gone. The mission here, to stop the wind-driven embers from igniting the house next door. Hey, that line all the way up. 
Sometimes the mission is more intense. A four-person strike team from the Colorado Springs Fire Department at the height of the fire with destruction all around. Their mission, to save this house. Steve, this was that day, and this was the northeast part of Black Forest, and this was a home that was clearly in imminent danger. Yeah, it, it, it was, and the, you know, the strike team, when they uh, uh, got into the preserve area in here, er, every one of the, uh, the engine uh, crews went out and their assignment was to protect this structure or that structure or this structure or that structure. Right now, those flames are, are back a ways and they don't look that scary yet. No. But what's about to change? Well, what's about to change is the wind's gonna pick up a little bit. If I recall, there was a, uh, a lot of um, uh, cut wood back there. So you, that's why you see that intensity. You okay. got more fuel, more fire. Right, so right. it's up to these four people to save somebody's home. That's right. And they know, they know what they're doing. I mean, they're, 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 there's a plan in place right now. Even as the flames appear to get stronger there, it's still waiting game right now. It, absolutely. You know, they were already pre-managing this house before the flames even got there. They were, you know, scraping some line. They're just letting the fire come to it. And you can see how, you know, the, the winds are starting to pick up and you it's can whipping. see it. Yeah. yeah, and you can see how it just, it's, you know, it's, it's traveling right along here and it's just preheating that fuel. And then that's when I kind of captured which I thought was a very, very remarkable scene right here, is where you can see the fire wanting to get up into the crown of that tree. Right. But it didn't have the ladder fuels. It didn't have the low-hanging branches. Had it had the low-hanging branches in there, it would have laddered right on up and then got up into the crown of the tree. The key right here is that mulch and that defensible space, as you call it. These homeowners did everything right. Yeah, they, they, they did everything right. The only thing that I, I, I would say, uh, and, and these are lessons that we learned at Waldo, was that mulch is definitely a slow wick to fire. So having mulch around the deck right there, that deck will eventually catch fire as that, so as that fire starts. So it's best you, to have something else. So something non-combustible like rock, gravel, you know, okay. decorative rocks. If there were trees against that deck in that house, this, this would be gone. D a different story, yeah, sure, because all the embers are going to start going up into the attic area or up on top of the roof. And e even if they had a non-combustible roof, it can still make its way inside that, that vent uh, into the attic. Mm -hmm. And the ones that have manicured their, their property and, and have mitigated and that give us the chance, those are the ones firefighters are going to hone in because they're going, we can save this. You, when you look at a scene like this, and this was a, a longer fight than we just showed, but these four guys had a plan, they executed, and they saved this house. That's the whole point, isn't it? Yeah, it, it, it is. I mean, a lot of times you don't get a really good opportunity to do that in a wildland situation, but it, this crew saw this opportunity to save that house and they said this is what we're going to do to manage it and that's what they did. As a firefighting professional, when you see a stand taken like that and a successful defense of a house, what does it make you feel? God, well, that's a big, I mean, it's just a big W in the wind column and I can't tell you how proud I was of that crew right there. That, that did that. I mean, they, they stood their ground, they drew, they, they drew that line in there uh, and, um, and they defended it. And it, it's, it, it's, that's a very, very good feeling. After this battle was won, 11 News was able to talk to Roger and Tana Faulkner. This was their house. It was just amazing to see the uh, courage and the hero activity that uh, transpired to save our home. I couldn't believe it was my house. I'm just watching the news like everybody else. And there's my house surrounded by flames and there's firefighters standing there with their backs to my house facing the flames. I was grateful, I was shocked, uh, I was in awe. Our crew was even there a few days later when they had a chance to thank the firefighters who saved their home. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, that's what we do. <laughs> you guys are awesome. Sometimes you, you're approached with a question, you know, Who's your hero? <laughs> and you have a hard time answering that. Not anymore, guys. Not anymore. You guys are our heroes. Fights like this played out all over Black Forest, and the houses that could be saved were the ones that were prepared for this possibility. Looking back five years later now, for people who were here at the time, even those, some of those who weren't, what is the bottom line message from the Black Forest fire? There are some great lessons that we have to learn and that we have to share with others, and that's what I did with that, that with that footage. I shared it with departments. I had calls from firefighters that, you know, said this is a good video to show our homeowners 
that mitigation does, does work. For me, my job was to document that and glean all the lessons that we could possibly learn off of that and then share it with everybody as much as possible. That's why we shared it with you. We wanted the public to see this. That's why we shared it with all the firefighters. We wanted firefighters to see how well some of this mitigation works and you don't get the opportunity to see it when it's going down. In the five years since the fire, this video has been used all over the world to educate homeowners about that crucial mitigation and to train fire crews on just what can happen in the heat of the battle. That's the lesson learned, but there's still a huge mystery surrounding the Black Forest fire. How did it start? As you're about to see, investigators know more than they're willing to tell us, but it's still not enough. 11 News anchor Adam Atchison talked to the sheriff. Five years after the Black Forest fire, the scars still remain. But beside the charred reminders of what took so much and left so little, it's easy to spot new life. It changed the landscape of it, but we just, we love being out here. The Hawkins family bought property that was once in the fire's path three years ago. They've built a brand new home, but Kelly says her kids still find pieces of the past. Charred spoons, silverware, the neighbors have really rallied together. Um, and supporting one another, whether it's supplying um, grass seed or providing chippers, just helping one another out to make sure that the area around here looks really good in spite of the fire. The community is more united and they still share the same question. What caused the Black Forest fire? Today, the investigation is in the hands of El Paso County Sheriff Bill Elder and his team. Where does it stand? Where does the investigation stand today? It's an open investigation. We have, uh, we continue to get leads. We continue to get tips. The sheriff says he has two people heading up an active investigation. Part of their full-time job is to look into the cause and narrow it down. What have you ruled out at this point? You know, we've ruled out anything weather-related, anything natural. Uh, this, you know, this was not spontaneous combustion. This was not a lightning strike. The Black Forest Fire Investigation Executive Summary, released a year after the fire, points out that wood cutting had been done in the area where the fire started using gas-powered tools and vehicles. It also says other residents had used their fireplaces. But according to the report, those gas-powered items were examined and ruled out. It doesn't say if the fireplaces were eliminated as a cause. Sheriff Elder says he has personally visited multiple possible points of origin for the Black Forest fire in this area, just west of Black Forest Regional Park. And while he doesn't talk specifics about where those possible points of origin are, he does say that fire was human caused. Are you still looking for a what or are you only looking for a who in this case right now? No, mostly it's a what at this point. Um, I think all of the who's are fairly well encircled. Um, it's more of a what. You know, I mean, there's still a possible who out there. We, we can't eliminate that. Um, there's just a lot of work that's got to be done. And no persons of interest? Not that I'm going to talk about. There's a lot of things that we know that most people don't. And the, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get a really tight rein around um, some of those items. But what's out there is everything from purely accidental you know, to um, to the potential of even arson. And that's a long way to go. And you sure don't want to point the finger. Like I said, you don't want to point the finger at somebody if, and be wrong. Elder says thousands of hours of interviews have already taken place, but he still invites people to call in tips because even half a decade later, there are still some things clouded in smoke in one of the state's biggest mysteries. You can rest assured that subject matter experts are continuing five years later, continuing to study evidence, study interviews, study documentation, um, study fire patterns. Um, you, you can't ask for more. Work left to do in the investigation and still so much work for those families. And a lot of the families have been learning over the years that being insured doesn't mean that the cleanup is covered. One local group that's been helping a lot is about to run out of money. 11 News anchor Katie Pelton has their story. Five years later, survivors of the Black Forest Fire are still grappling with their loss. I had nothing. I had nothing at all. And, you know, to think your whole life, sorry, your whole life just passed, you know, in front of you still traumatic. 
Patty Olney remembers the call she got to evacuate. So I came in and got my animals out. I got nothing else. I got my dogs. I didn't even get my purse. Um, and fortunately, I had a small. I have a small motor home, and I just stuffed everybody in there and left. But I'm certain my house was pretty well gone by the time I hit Meridian Road. Her house was destroyed. The fire chief called and said, "I can take you up to your house. I'll go. I'll go with you." And it's a good thing he did, because you don't think that absolutely everything would be gone, and. Um, Everything was gone. Everything, everything. There, we found absolutely nothing. She says insurance covered her house, but the destruction around it was up to her. They don't do really anything for your property. A nonprofit called Black Forest Together was formed to help families like hers with problems like that. Without the support of these people and some of others, I don't know what I would have done. We were emotionally involved in this. Ed Bracken is the founder. You got people going out and running the chipper every weekend. So it's, it's an emotional thing and we're committed to this neighborhood because the back force together people are very resilient. The people in the community are very resilient. Volunteers help with recovery by clearing charred trees, replanting and more. They've worked for more than 47,000 hours on hundreds of projects and they aren't done yet. How many residents, neighbors in this area still need work done? Well, there's there is 14,000 acres of black trees that were burnt and 488 houses. About 300 people have rebuilt, and, but they have this situation to face, you know, with the black trees and and uh, taking the, if you look over to the uh, west here, there's a whole stand of black trees. We have to convince them people to take care of those trees because they're a safety hazard. Still work to do, but as the years have gone by, so have their funds. The group tells me that it costs more than $10,000 a month to run the nonprofit. It goes pretty good, fast, you know. And uh, we just, are, we have to manage our money year to year, depending upon private donations to get it, but we are hurting on money. Some of their expenses are reimbursed through a government grant, but it's set to run out this month. If we don't get any money, we're going to have to close the doors. But uh, I, I'm not looking forward to that. I don't think we'll have to do that because we keep appealing to the people and they come through. Patty said she desperately needs this group to help her with her property for things like this, this pile of wood laying here that still needs to be chipped. And she's not the only one. The group says there are 68,000 acres that still need mitigation. I'm hoping that we can keep them alive for me and everybody else. If you want more information about Black Forest Together, head to KKTV.com and click Find It. The fire did so much damage, disrupted so many lives, but it did help bring a community together. So we leave you with some of those inspiring moments. It's a bolt action pin made out of more wood. God bless you, brother. Thank, Thank you very much. This is good, this is a really boost everybody's morale, so it's a great community here. Right.